Y'all doing all right? Good, mo- good, after- good evening, church. Yeah. And you guys online, you hope you're on there. If you're not, I'm going to look on there and see who's on here and who's not. I'm going to give them all calls this week. You know, there you go. So we're in this Romans series. We're in Romans 8. Pastor Jeff did a good job. And this morning, he points out in Romans 8, and my message title tonight, by the way, is groanings, groanings, groanings. And uh, you ever groaned before? People groan at my bad humor, but that's okay. It doesn't bother me one bit. Uh, And one of the key verses is that uh, those, verse five, those who live according to the sinful nature have their mind set on what the nature desires, but those who live in accordance to the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. And uh, the mind of the sinful man is death, but the mind of the the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. But those who are controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. But you, however, are controlled by the, not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to, he doesn't belong to Christ. So Christ Jesus, his Spirit, when you are born again. In fact, there are three baptisms in the Bible. One is, the first one, We are baptized into the body of Christ called the baptism of the Spirit. We're born again, John 3, by the Spirit of God. We're born by the Spirit. The Spirit redeems us, renews us, regenerates us. The Spirit of God is what comes in and changes our heart. It's the Spirit of grace in Hebrews that people insult and walk on the blood of Christ when they say, it's okay, I'll just live in my sin. God knows I'm going to heaven anyway. No, you're not. Hebrews says, no, you're not. And there's a birth, a rebirth of the Spirit. And when you're born of the Spirit, the Spirit comes in and baptizes you into the body of Christ. And then there's the baptism of water. That's, that's the baptism of, of John's, which is, is what, that of repentance. That when we die to ourselves, we're buried with Christ and we come alive to Jesus Christ. And old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And then there's the baptism of Jesus. John said, I baptize with water, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, and I am not even worthy to, to unlatch his shoes or tie his shoes. And he, the one that comes after me, who's that? Jesus. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. It's Jesus' baptism into the Spirit, and it's the Spirit's baptism into Jesus. Because you can't be born again unless you're born by the Spirit. Say Amen. So we are spiritual creatures. We are the Holy Spirit people and Jesus is in us and it's by his spirit when we're born again. Now there is another dimension of the fullness of the spirit. We can be full of the spirit just like they experienced on day of Pentecost and I call that the total immersion. I'm I'm talking about when you get baptized in water, picture it. I mean the Holy Spirit's all over you. The Holy Spirit takes over everything and that's what we're striving for. But like Jeff said, the Native American little tale that they would teach a a little truth with, you got two dogs, and maybe they're twin dogs, right? They look just alike. I mean, they're exactly the same dog. Whichever one you feed is going to be the strongest one. And you got the flesh inside you, and you got the spirit inside you. That was a great illustration. I'm going to tell you, you feed the spirit with with the food of the spirit, the word of God. You feed the spirit with worship. The Holy Spirit comes with true worship and spirit and truth and Jesus. You feed your spirit that way. You feed your spirit by prayer and communion with God and you feed your spirit with fellowship that is spiritual fellowship, not Green Bay Packer fellowship because you get depressed when you're a Green Bay Packer fellowshipper. Now some of you might be chief fellowshippers, Kansas City chief fellowshippers. You might still have a little joy, but that's not spiritual joy. That's football joy, and it's very short-lived, trust me. <laughs> oh, my, my. What's the, what's the commercial say about sports? Oh, the thrill of victory and the and agony of defeat. Oh, <laughs> it's so true, but not with Jesus. We've got to be spirit people. So why do I bring that back up? Here's why. Because where Pastor Jeff left off, we get into this whole thing about the, that the Father is Abba Father, okay? And I, I'll, just, I'll just pick this up a little bit there and just touch on it. 
Uh, it says in verse, uh, let me start in verse 14. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that made you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. Your sons and daughters is what you are, children of God. That's what it's saying. A Holy Spirit has made you children. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, our very personal dad, God, our Father, one that loves us and that we can come to, that we respect but we're not afraid of, we run to him. And that we know he holds us in the palm of his hand and we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit himself testifies with our human spirit that we're God's children. See, the Spirit of God is the only thing that can tell someone they're God's children. You can take theology and say, oh yeah, you were saved. You don't know if they were saved. Only the man knows if they were saved. Don't ever tell anybody they were saved. You show them the book, let them know that. Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You don't know, you have no business telling someone they're saved. You show them the way, you let the Spirit convince them because the Spirit testifies with the human spirit that you're born again. You, you believe that? There's a lot of people running around think they're saved because people told them they're saved and they don't look any more saved than a brick wall. They just got salvation theology that says, I'm going to heaven, I could give a rip about the kingdom of God. You know the word, the Lord gave me a word, I'm gonna give one of these days in the morning, I'll give it to y'all free tonight. How in the world, Lord, the Lord showed me this, how in the world do you call yourselves a Christian when you never give one dime and tithe to God and never give the missions? If, you, if that's you, just check the words of Jesus about there's God and seeking God or mammon and money. Which one do you serve? That's why God places that in your place. So I'm telling you, you can't make somebody that's never been born again give their money. They're not gonna do it. That's why Jesus told the rich man, he could tell he wasn't born again by the question he's asking. And he said, I'll tell you what you do. You go sell everything you give and go all your money to the poor. He went away sad. And Jesus didn't go, whoa, 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 come, come, come back, come back. I mean, just give us a little bit of it because after all, you're really rich and we can use your money. No, because he wasn't interested in his money. He was interested in his soul, the saving. Are you with me? So, I mean, you're talking only God can do that by his spirit. And only God can convince you you're born again. It's what they call, uh, I am persuaded, you know, uh, I, I know who I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep me until that day. That's spiritual confidence in God. Amen? Are you with me? You, you look like a beautiful bunch of people and you're out there jumping up and down. I love to preach to people like you. And those of you in your living rooms, I'm sure you're doing the same thing. Just settle down. Sit down there. Pull your zipper all the way up on your little pajamas tops and, and we'll be good to go. Now then, so I'm gonna tell you right now, the Holy Spirit himself, verse 16, he, he's the one that testifies with our spirit that we're God's children, that he's our father, Abba Father. Now if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. I don't know, stop right there. Now that's the part you like, but you don't like the next part. Because nobody that's wanting to be a follower of Jesus wants to admit that you might go through problems on the earth. Now, this whole chapter is all put together. It's, there's pieces of it where he's talking to you about what does it look like to really be born again? What does it look like to really have the, the life of Christ? And it looks like having the spirit life, not the flesh life. That's the first part of it. Then the rest, then Jeff's part, he con that's his part. He continues right in there. He, beautiful job he preached on that. And then he turns the corner and he's going, guess what? Just because you're a child of God and just because the spirit of God is in you, yes, you, that's your daddy, yes, that's your father, but doesn't mean that you're not gonna have trouble on earth. Jesus said it in John, he said, in this world you'll, you'll, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And notice what he says here in verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Did they have reason to fear? Absolutely. It was, listen, I, I believe, uh, uh, I, just, I, I just looked that up because I was trying to remember exactly the dates. But I'm pretty sure at Paul, in AD uh, 65, Paul was imprisoned. And uh, he died shortly after that. And let me tell you something. The Roman Christians were being persecuted like crazy. They were putting, they were putting to death. I mean, I've been to the place, the catacombs in Rome, Italy, right where they had Paul. He, he was later 
uh, I, I, think, I think the record has it that he was be beheaded. And uh, so, I mean, you, you've, got, you've got all kinds of problems here. Uh, let me look what it says. You know, they, from the very beginning, right after Jesus' was first century, I mean, the Christians everywhere were being persecuted. So he's writing to this. So he's saying this, he says, look, you got Abba Father, you have the Spirit of God. You have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in you. You're special. God has got something really good for you. But guess what? You're not, you're not immune to the troubles of the world. You're not in this world in a place where you're not going to go through something. Jesus came into a world where the craziest man that ever ruled was ruling. And he, had, he, had, he had a venereal disease and he had gone mentally mad. Herod the Great. He went to kill the babies over in Bethlehem. He was a nutcase. He killed wives. He killed his own sons. He was a nut. He was so insecure, he didn't want anybody to rule. And Jesus walked into the greatest darkness. And you talk, they had, they had temples where they had uh, orgies and all kinds of craziness going on there. I mean, it's, it was a nutty world that Jesus came into. The darkest of the darkest. Look at our world. It's bad. But G he says, listen. He says here, he says, don't be afraid. He didn't give you a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. 365 times the Bible says, don't fear, don't fear, don't fear. I'm not afraid of nothing. I'm not. Well, I am afraid of my wife a little bit, but other than that, it depends on what I'm saying to her <laughs> as a joke. But anyway, she's, she's pretty nice when she's upset. She just gives me a look. So. But notice what it says. We're heirs with God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Let me ask you something. Do you think you're better than the 12 disciples of Jesus? So what are you gonna do when they chop your head off? Huh? They tell you deny Christ or they're gonna chop your head. What are you gonna do when they hang you upside down on a cross? I'm asking you a question. What are, they, what are you going to do when they, when they chase you, you, throw you in a hole in a little cave down in, the, like in, in Rome, Italy? What are you going to do? Are you going to say, where's God? God's not real. Well, well, how could this possibly happen? My life just really stinks. It's terrible. You know what? What are we looking at? What are we living for? The pleasures and comfort of this world? That's what most Christians are looking for. They're more concerned about the trouble in the world than they are people dying and going to hell. They talk more about everything else that's going wrong instead of the souls that are lost. They criticize people that are blind and lost for being blind and lost instead of praying their soul gets saved. We need to pray for people that are blind and lost. Are you with me? It's true. We don't have anything to fear. Fear not. Get right with God, stay right with God. It's time to charge, take the gospel. Go forward in the name of Jesus. Use the mighty name of Jesus. Preach the blood of Christ. Hold up the cross of Jesus Christ and go forward like mighty soldiers with the truth of Jesus that no one will shut your mouth. You wanna offend somebody? Offend them over Jesus. Offend them over the blood of Jesus. Preach the truth of gospel that will change a heart. That's how you offend people. That's what the Bible says, it's an offense to those that are in darkness and love this, the deeds of darkness and the sin. They don't want to hear it. And Paul right here, verse 18, is one of the two key verses. This is a key, really a key verse, a turning point. In the, in the, I love the King James. For I reckon that the present sufferings of this here world are not even worthy to be compared to the glory that awaits us. The word reckon there is a calculation word, it's, a, it's an accounting word, it's when you balance books. He's saying when I balance up the books and I look at the glory that awaits me and I look at the reward of heaven and I look at the gift of salvation, the trouble in this world is not even worth comparing. It's like comparing uh, a very muddy pie to pecan pie. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's, it's like comparing uh, eating brick that you heat up to eating a nice steak. That's, you, you, you can't even compare, not worthy. Don't even go there. It's okay, heaven is so great you can't even believe it. The streets are gold in heaven. The walls have finest jewel, jewels in them like you can't ever believe. And he says in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings, and here we are, are not worthy compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. 
The creation, look at this. The creation, what's the creation? Uh, everything, the, all the things created, in the, 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 you know, uh, nature, animals, those things, you know. The mountains, vegetation, um, the tornadoes and, and straight line tornadoes, what's that called? Du yeah, that, duration. I never knew what it was. It was bad. You know, earthquakes, all that stuff in creation. The creation, look, even creation waits in eager expectation for us, the sons of God, to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration because of Adam and Eve, that's my commentary. Because sin came and just messed up creation. There were never any tornadoes or earthquakes. You know, lions and lambs laid together. People didn't eat meat and, and animals didn't eat each other. Do you know that? All that kind of stuff happened because of the fall of man, sin. Creation was subject to the frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation, look at this, verse 21, itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into glorious freedom of who? The children of God. See, we have that freedom in the midst of a slave world. We have the freedom that's in Christ, that's walking in the spirit in the midst of a world of people that are enslaved. He says, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. Don't go back to slavery. Don't, 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 don't be enslaved to fear. We're free. Heaven's our home. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of your faith. You know what that verse is? Hebrews 12, 1. You know what's, 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 what, right, what is right before it in Hebrews 11? All the great things the great heroes of faith did, but at the end of the chapter, and it says, by faith, some were cut in two, sawn asunder. Some were, some were put to death, but they were by faith. They overcame and they were victorious by faith. Just because you die a martyr doesn't mean you don't die in faith. In fact, that what greater faith is there? And the blood of martyrs uh, fertilize the soil for salvation. That's why you see where the countries and nations that are being persecuted the most and they're putting Christians to death and imprisoning them, that the gospel underground is going crazy. Go look at Cuba, look at India, look at uh, Iran, look at uh, uh, China. I mean, there's nations where it's, you know, it's against the law for anyone that's there to try to tell people about Jesus and his, his freedom and free from enslavement of sin and self. It's against the law. So, so listen, what are we afraid of? Nothing, nothing, don't be afraid. God doesn't give us a spirit of fear. You get a prophecy that grips fear in your heart, it's not from God. You hear me? You hear a prophecy that puts fear in your heart, it's not from God. Point blank. What is prophecy for? First Corinthians, for exhortation, edification and comfort. Hello, are you with me? Let me tell you what a prophetic thing is, the one I gave, that God gave me. Get right with God, stay right with God, don't be afraid, don't back up, don't pulse, run at it, give the world Jesus, because they're desperate, they're lost, and they have no hope, and Jesus is the hope. That's the word, that's true, that's biblical. All right, where was I? Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning. There it is, groanings. Groaning number one is creation, as in pains of childbirth right up to the present time. See that? That's why you want to answer people, right there's the worst, why people get killed in tornadoes and people, you know, have storms and all that. You think the garden was like that, huh? Did, did you hear Adam, did you hear God tell Adam and Eve? Now, all those trees you can eat from, but not that one. And also you can eat any cow that's walking around and you can eat, you can, you can butcher and cook you up some bacon out of those pigs that are on the ground. Did he say any of that stuff? Now that all, I'm gonna tell you right now, you may not like it, those of you that like meat, but they didn't eat meat, they may had fish and they had vegetables, but not meat. And that's why when you get to heaven, the lion isn't gonna to try to eat the lamb. 
The Bible paints a picture he lays down. And by the way, if you're a believer, this is outside of theology, it's my opinion. So you can definitely disagree with this. But I think your pet, if you're redeemed, your pet gets to go to heaven because there's going to be animals in heaven. And I don't think the unredeemed animals are going to get there. I think it's the redeemed that have their animals. So little Lucille Weaver, my grand dog, got Christian parents are going to be in heaven. Hallelujah. Even cats. <laughs> pet crats of Christians. But the lion and the lamb are going to lay together. Creation's going to be solved. There's not going to be any more weather events in heaven. Creation's not going to grow. That's the curse of, of sin, the thorns that man had to have on the ground and to work the, work the land. That was, remember how he, he told Adam? You're going to have to work hard because it's not going to grow. You're going to have to dig up the soil and fight thorns and all, kind, all of that kind of stuff you don't like, those little burrs that get on you and stickers and all that stuff. That stuff wasn't in the Garden of Eden. That's part of the curse. Anybody, anything that you hate when you're doing gardening, that wasn't there. I'm just telling you, now that's my opinion. And 99.34% of the time I'm correct. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Creation groans, but guess what? When we, when we have our redemption complete and the trumpet sounds and we get out of here and fly away and go to heaven, Creation going to quit a groaning because it's going to be redeemed too. What does it say in the Bible? He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. Woo! Redemption, baby. All creation. And look what it says. The groaning, the innate creation been groaning of pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And you know, women, childbirth pains aren't that good. Verse 23, second, second groaning. Not only so, but we ourselves, that's the believers. Believers, we ourselves, you. He's writing to the believers. Who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Born again, right? Have the Spirit. Spirit fruit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, temperance, faith, faith goodness, and, and a couple other things not in those nine, a lot of them. The Spirit, the first fruit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons and redemption of our bodies. Now I want you to notice something. The believers groan. Listen, he's writing to the Romans. Man, listen to me. Grief. You know, Jesus was going to the cross and he sweat blood drops. He was in great groaning. You remember that? Huh? Are you with me? Was he sinning? We could go through some times and make us groan. Even right now, man, I'll tell you, there's things going around just to make me groan. I hate abortion. It makes me groan. I can go down the list, but don't, don't take me another 30 minutes to preach. And I'm not going to go down that list of things I hate. But it makes me groan. It makes me weary inside. And the Christ Jesus in me, and as a believer, I just groan inwardly. And we are waiting eagerly, eager for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. You see, we are saved and the Spirit are going to go to heaven, but our bodies are still on this earth. That's why I look like this. Because if my body had gotten redeemed totally, and been totally, you know, I wouldn't look this way. I used to be average, like a three instead of a zero, you know, in, on the one to 10 scale. So we're gone downhill in a hurry, but look at that. The, we ourselves, believers, have first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we eagerly await our adoption as sons. Look at it, it says, the redemption of our body. So the body, no more. What does it say in Revelation? No more pain, no more tears, no more suffering, no more dying. Right? That's, that's what we're talking about. At the end of time, we go to heaven. What a day it's going to be, right? And so, he says this. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is not is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he has already has? Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So that's what I'm saying right there is that you see the trouble doesn't mean you don't lose your hope. Hope is, you don't have to hope for what you can see. The Rome was in a trouble, the Christians there, they persecuted. They kept their hope, right? And, and, and no, their, things were not looking good, what they saw. We can see things that aren't there, but guess what? Don't be afraid. God's with us. Our hope is sure, this is the blessed hope that someday, whether they martyr me 
or whether I die of old age or whether war takes me or they persecute me and put me to death for my faith, their hope will become complete for me, right? Because I know who I have believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep me until that day. And then in verse 26, there's two groanings. The groaning of creation, the groaning of believers. The third one is in the same way. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts know the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. Notice again, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. He's talking about weakness, people coming against us, trouble, you know, that we can't do it on our own. We need God's spirit. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. I wanna go back up here and I want you to see something in verse 22. We know that whole creation has been groaning. Verse 23, not only, but we ourselves who have the first through the spirit groan inwardly. So if it's us groaning inwardly, that would be number two, verse 23. If when it says the spirit groans, that would be us. We already got that going on in verse 20, 23. See it? Now we use this to say that when you have the Holy Spirit, you, God helps you pray in a language, right? Yeah. Tongues, tongues is an antiquated word for spiritual language and gives you the language to pray because you don't know how to pray and it mentions that. That's something, but this is not talking about a language. He says no words can express, it's not words. Now I know you've been taught that and if you want to continue to believe it, I'm okay with it. But when you take it in context, you got three groanings. You got the groaning of creation, you got the groaning of believers that we groan within and the spirit of God because he loves you so much groans with you because he hurts. Like he wept over Lazarus' grave. That doesn't take away the fact that when you don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit gives you a prayer link. I believe that with all my heart, and Paul teaches it, but you don't need this verse to do that. Now, it could be part of it. You could be groaning and praying in a spiritual language. It could be together. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not picking a bone here, it doesn't matter. What I'm saying though is, I wanna make this point. Listen to me carefully and don't miss the point. You online, listen to the point. The point is God loves you so much when you hurt, he hurts with you. You understand that? Mary and Martha were hurting, they were crying. Lazarus had died and Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus wept. And right now the Father from above, when he sees the groanings, the things you go through, your loved ones are sick, You're, you've got all kinds of things going on in your life, people die. Right now we have people that die, a brother that dies. We got, we got parents that have died. We have people near death that we love. And let me tell you something, God groans. I'm gonna tell you right, if he doesn't, he sees the sparrow fall, he sees what goes on with his children, he's Abba Father. And all he's saying is this, guys, yes, the Spirit is in you. And yes, you may be led of the Spirit, you might be godly, don't go, well, God, why did you let this happen? I was godly, the Spirit of God was here, you, where are you? I can only have a hard time believing in you, God. I mean, I'm having a hard time with this because my, my so-and-so died. My so-and-so got sick. This didn't go right. This was reverse. This was wrong. This was bad. And he's saying, don't lose hope. We don't live for this world alone. Our hope is forever. You with me? You see the context he's writing to a church, believers in Rome that are being extremely persecuted. And he's turning the corner saying, yes, your father is an Abba father. And yes, the spirit of God is in you. And yes, you bear fruit of the spirit. And yes, you're full of the spirit. And yes, you're a believer, but it doesn't guarantee you a perfect life. Like this old country songwriter that my high school basketball coach made me listen to it every time we'd drive out of town for a game. Never promise you a rose garden. Oh, remember that one? He loved that song. Because even back then he said, but y'all, you young people think you got some rose garden I promise to you. This life is tough, quit acting that way. And that's true. Jesus didn't promise a trouble-free world. He, he, he told us he would give us strength. He would give us backbone. He would give us hope. He would give us faith. We'd face death right in the eye and say, God is God. And I'm gonna tell you, when he goes through, he's crying with you. He's groaning, the spirit groans with you. And he may be helping you pr pray in a spiritual language when you're groaning, but it says right here, if you just look at it, look at the words, 
The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And I have looked at every version. I don't believe he's, the Spirit is groaning. Not we groan before that, we who are believers. You see it, verse 23. Then the Spirit's groaning with us. In other words, there's empathy. He loves you. And that's my message today. He loves you. I don't care what we're going to go through in the future. Buck up. Because God loves us. No matter what happens, never doubt it. No matter how horrible your life gets, God loves you. Lose your job, God loves you. Lose most of your clothes, God loves you. Got one set of clothes and just enough to eat, God loves you. God has not abandoned you. He's for you. You get on the chapter, you see it. He's for you. He's not against you. You know, you just keep looking at it. You, nothing's going to keep you from God from loving you. Just because these things happen, that God's love is still right there towards you. That's how the chapter. Now, some people read that to go, you know, it doesn't matter what you do. You, you, once you're a believer, you can't ever get out of the arms of God and his love. And, and I, don't, I don't know that, that I, 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 I buy that deal. I, I do believe that there's assurance. And I do believe it's very hard if I've called on Christ to ever really been born again to ever want to go back. I, I, I just do. But I'm talking about people that have truly been born again by the Spirit. And the Spirit of God grabs a hold of them. Are you with me? All right. So that's it. That's my message. Been a while, I probably preached longer than I should have. That's all of it right there. Gave you the whole boat. <laughs>